Great. Well, good evening. Very warm welcome to um, our book group on the book of Marjorie Kemp as we continue our journeys with her. So tonight um, we're looking at chapters 51 to 58. It's a, it's a bit of a shorter section I gave you to read, but actually it kind of hangs together. Um, and so we really are. Uh, the title I gave to this is The Trials and Tribulations of Marjorie. So we really are diving into poor old Marjorie's trials um, and her tribulations. I think she has a bit of a tough time in this section, but I don't know about you. Um, by the end of it, I had a, a real respect for Marjorie and the way she was able to stand up in very difficult situations and uh, speak the truth and speak of gospel truth, which is really important. So it's interesting that at the beginning of chapter 51, which we started reading tonight, there's a very short paragraph. And in a sense, that paragraph pretty much sums what is going to happen in the next um, five or six chapters. Because she tells us that right at the beginning, she's accused um, in Latin of having a strange lifestyle. Now, those of you who looked up the Latin will know that this um, cheeky cleric says to her that her place is basically to increase and multiply. And of course, that comes from the marriage service. It was an important part of the marriage service. And so... Um, he's kind of saying to her, you know, you're a married wife and you should be going home and, and you're know, having children. But her answer is a really impressive spiritual one. And the cleric is actually won over. And he says, well, OK, yeah, that was good. That was a good answer. And wins, as I say, and wins, wins, um, she wins him over. And I would say that that is a bit of a, a summary for what's going to unfold in the next few chapters. Because again, we have this kind of cycle with Marjorie of being accused, then defending herself, and then winning people over. I think there's only one or two people by the end of this section who she really can't win over deep, real deep um, enemies of hers. So if we just think about the the um, occasions, there are a number of occasions, but there are particularly um, three occasions. And you hear them kind of mounting up in um, seriousness. So we have this simple little one at the beginning, which is not particularly serious, just someone, you know, kind of slandering her a bit. But then they get more and more and more serious until she's actually standing before the um, ecclesiastical, the highest ecclesiastical authorities of her day. So the first one is that she's in York and she's in York Minster. And there's something about, you know, that she 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 makes a bit of a stir in York Minster, which we're not really surprised at because it's our Marjorie. We've got to know her a little bit now. And there was this sort of promise that she would be leaving over 14 days and she doesn't want to do that. So again, there's this aspect of wanting to try and contain this woman, wanting to tell her what to do. And in each instance, people cannot tell her what to do. She is not under the authority of any human force or human institution or human representative she is under the authority of god and her spiritual life is what dictates her relationship with god so first of all she's in york and she's sobbing and so all the people are called together in the chapter house and there she has to give an account of her life and this this is then escalated so that she actually comes before the archbishop and she's accused of being a lollard or a heretic. There is a court that is held against her, but Marjorie once again defends herself beautifully 
and they actually ask her about all the articles of faith. Can she actually prove that she is um, someone who is um, orthodox in the faith? And basically, she 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 just runs rings around around them all and can show that she's completely orthodox. And then what I really like is that section about where they ask her to swear that she'll leave the diocese. And once again, trying to impose this kind of power on her, and it's the power of the oath at this time. And she basically says, well, no, <laughs> I need to go and see this person. And then they ask her to swear not to teach. And instead, she has that very clever argument that whoever goes around and speaks the gospel of Christ is, is actually doing what Christ asked them to do. And so how can anyone be condemned for speaking the gospel? And if people see that as teaching, then it's not her problem. And then she gives us this really funny, this funny story um, <clears throat> about the priest and the old pilgrim, uh, which obviously amuses the Archbishop of Law York. And then we, she ends that section, that section with in front of the Archbishop, with her absolutely being liked and allowed to go free. So remarkable how she is winning over, winning over the biggest authorities of the land, ecclesiastical authorities. Um, and yet at the beginning, it stands in such a detrimental situation that you wonder, oh my goodness, is, is she going to just be uh, condemned and burnt, uh, burnt as a heretic? Mm. And then the next one is um, she really is arrested and imprisoned for um, being what they call a lollard. And she's tried this time in the chapter house of the of Beverly, Beverly Minster, by the Archbishop of York. And what's really interesting here is not just about the ecclesiastical powers that's going on, but also about the secular, the civil powers that are actually beginning to take a play. So we hear quite a bit about this figure, the Duke of York, and how particularly one of the clerics is afraid to upset the Duke of Bedford. I mean, sorry, the Duke of Bedford, upset, uh, worried about upsetting this obviously very powerful figure at the time. So we now have this kind of complex interplay of power between the ecclesiastical and also in the secular. But once again, Marjorie just runs rings around at them. And um, the Archbishop of York sort of says, well, why, why am I seeing this woman again? What, what's, what's going on? And in the end, he gives her something which is really crucial. He gives her not only his blessing, but he gives her a ring which has the seal of the Archbishop of York and a letter. Now they are really, really, really important because if she doesn't have that, then she doesn't she she doesn't come under anyone's protection. So she's very easily imprisoned um, because she doesn't have this kind of um, seal of authority. So once she gets that, it's really crucial. And if you remember, she loses it at one point, and then has to go and get it again from the Archbishop of Canterbury. So, um, my goodness, she must have felt such a headache to some of these authorities. But for us, who's reading this story, we're, she's becoming a bit of a champion. So it's interesting that um, a number of occasions in these chapters that Marjorie is accused of being a Lollard. So I thought that I would use um, most of this introduction to actually think about, well, who are the Lollards? And was Marjorie actually a Lollard? And what does it mean anyway? So if we go back to right to the beginning, um, Lollard, Lollardy, or Lolla, as they were called, these were two names and they were sort of 
slanderous, derogatory nicknames that were used for those who didn't have any academic learning and who particularly um, needed everything in English. So they might have had an education, but actually they only really spoke in English. And what what what's important is they don't have the learning to be able to read in Latin or even speak in Latin. Now, the whole Lollard movement really arose from a person called John Wycliffe, who was a Catholic theologian um, working and living and teaching within Oxford, Oxford University, around the, 13, uh, the 1380s, that sort of time. So much before, a long time before Marjorie. Now, he had this kind of vision, this notion of having the Bible translated into English. And he actually translated the Bible into English himself. And it's known as the Wycliffe Bible. Now, some people have said that this was more, more well received than actually the hierarchy of the church would have wanted. And so in a number of libraries, private libraries of noble people, they would actually have a Wycliffe, a Wycliffe Bible, manuscript of the Wycliffe Bible. And so there was this kind of groundswell of a desire within um, the society at the time to actually um, release some of the, the um, what was hidden within the church, so release some of the power of the church so that the people had much more of an understanding and a say and a relationship with God. Now, if you think this, this runs hand in hand with the peasants' revolt, um, which again was um, the peasants' uprising, against the, their rulers, their lords, their aristocracy, about being um, forced to have a poll tax and having enormous taxes put on them. So you have to think that this is a, a, a period in which we're post, um, we're post Black Death. A third, over, a, over two thirds of the population have died and so we're in this realm wherein the actual, the peasants of the time, those people who have to do all the stuff, are actually beginning to have more of a voice. We have the mercantile middle classes beginning to develop. And so they also are getting a sense of education. They're wanting to know about their faith much more. And because they've lived through this horrendous period of awful death and loss and agony and suffering, really want to go into what is their faith in Jesus Christ really about the, the one who hangs on the cross to be with us in our suffering. So there's this real, it's, it's sort of across the whole society, this kind of ground movement to really understand faith, to have a deeper relationship with God and also to have more of a say within civic and ecclesia ecclesiastical law and power. So it's in that atmosphere that you have someone like John Wycliffe coming forward and saying, I've translated the Bible into English. And you could just imagine everyone go, oh, wow. You know, and the aristocracy say, I've got to get my hands on that. And of course, they've got enough money to pay for it. Um, and so then there was this absolute desire to really start looking at some of the structures of the church, which folk were seeing as inhibiting their relationship with, with God. Now, often we think that the Reformation starts much later with, you know, Henry VIII, but the, the seeds of that Reformation are actually sown in this period, in the late 14th century, which why this, is, this period is such an interesting one, 
because we have all these mystical writings, but also we have this searching, searching um, of lay people at the time to actually understand and develop their relationship with God. So there were um, key features of what became known as the Lollard movement. And as I get, again, I say it really rises out of Wycliffe's vision of, um, of a place where all can read the Bible, but also his, um, his very radical ideas about what does the church mean. But he was not really the spearhead of so much of the movement. It was what he said that was picked up and then taken into a movement first by the kind of knights and the aristocracy, and then later much more by the laity, the, the, the poorer folk. And also initially it was very much taken up by clergy at that time. He was similarly wanting this same uh, reform. So the Lollard movement, when it became distilled into a movement, which is much later than the 1380s and 90s, it was more like the 1400s, was seen as having um, key features. And these were called the 12 conclusions of the Lollards. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to give you all of them, <laughs> but just to give you a flavour of what were the kind of things that they were asking for. And also, it's very interesting to note um, how people at that time might look at Marjorie and call her a Lollard. So one of the key ones, the key ones, was uh, the Eucharist. So interesting how the Eucharist is always, um, and what the Eucharist is, is always becomes a bone of contention uh, for Christians. So the Lollards, such as John, um, John Oldcastle and William Thorpe, they very much taught a view of the real presence of Christ in the Holy Communion, but not transubstantiation transubstantiation you word that um now of course those of you who know your theology of the eucharist will know that transubstantiation is the doctrine that teaches that at the eucharist the body and the blood of christ um literally become the bread and the wine um Become the, become the body and blood of Christ. So the bread and the wine literally become the body and blood of Christ. So that when you receive the bread of the Eucharist, you are receiving um, the body of Christ. And of course, that language is used in our Eucharist. Now, what um, the Lollards say is, no, you don't actually, you don't actually receive the body of Christ or the blood of Christ what you are receiving is still bread but the presence of Christ is there very early on um, a priest called Richard Saltry was burned in 1401 for his belief just in that that bread remained in the same nature as before the con consecration but what's important is that it represents and shows the presence of Christ. Now, of course, you can hear that, gosh, how similar is that of what um, is later taught by the Protestant movement? But there it is, way back in the, um, in the early 15th, um, late 14th century. The second thing that they they really um, were emphasized, emphasized was that Lollards did not believe that the church practices of baptism and confession were necessary for salvation. So they took out baptism and confession. They still saw them as sacraments. They didn't go as far as to say that they weren't sacraments, but they said they were not necessary for salvation. 
And instead, they taught that there was a universal priesthood, which denied then any special status to priests. So the Lollards were um, extremely anti-clerical at this time. And many people were anti-clerical as well, because, you know, you couldn't you couldn't have salvation unless it was through the church. Um, you couldn't be forgiven unless you had confessed to a priest. So the priest was seen as quite a barrier between people's relationship, um, between themselves and between God. And they were a very powerful force. Thirdly, they considered that praying to saints and honouring images was just idolatry. And so they also rejected all those devotional practices of the church, which the medieval church was so renowned for. So, for example, holy water, bells, organs, images, statues, saints' days, and most crucially of all, papal pardons. So they didn't believe, first of all, that there was this purgatory. And secondly, they didn't believe that a papal pardon was of anything any more worth than the paper it was written on. Well, they didn't have paper at the time, but you know what I mean. Uh, and so that really decreased the role of the priest. So no longer was the role seen especially important as a confessor when you why couldn't someone just confess to christ you didn't need someone as an intermediary you didn't need a papal you know pardon to be able to have salvation you had a relationship with christ and that was what was important so once again gosh doesn't it sound like the the protestant sort of church that flourished um, just a, a few hundred years after this through people like um, Luther and Zwingli and all those amazing Protestant theologians. And then finally, a crucial one, of course, was that the Lollards um, saw religion, saw Christianity primarily as, um, as based on vernacular scripture. Um, and they later believed that everyone should have access to their own Bible, that they shouldn't have to have a priest who read the Bible to them, that they could understand it in their own, what was known as vulgar tongue at the time. And it's interesting that at a number of trials um, of people who were Lollards, they often used uh, as a defence the fact that they would say, well, I'm illiterate, so I can't read anyway. So why are you accusing me of reading the Bible in English? So they would use that as their defense against a suspicion of lollardy. And finally, perhaps this is the one that really um, catches Marjorie most of all, is that they argued that both men and women should be able to teach and preach the gospel. Oh my goodness. Hence, someone like Marjorie is really walking a very fine line when she is going around just even speaking about the gospel, which can be interpreted as teaching. And also, if you think about in the book that we've seen so far, We've seen so many people go to her and say, what do I need to be saved? And she says, well, you need to start living a virtuous life and you need to give up that. And you need to. So she's so much in the book so far is, is seeing her acting in that role of guide, in that role of teacher and crucially in that kind of role as priest. So the really important figure as well as John Wycliffe, is also the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Arundel. Now, he was initially the Archbishop of York, 
not when, of course, Marjorie sees him, but he was later the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1397 to 1414. And he was openly against the Lollards. And if you want to know why did we not have um, a Reformation in the early 15th century, and we had it centuries later, it's because of Archbishop Arundel. I'll leave you to, to consider uh, what kind of a figure that was and whether it was a good decision or not. But um, in um, 1400, Henry IV passed a statute which empowered bishops to not only arrest, but imprison and examine offenders who were accused of lollardy. And then to hand them over to the secular authorities, um, such as um, had relapsed or refused to adjure. So it meant it gave the bishops power to pretty much pull anyone off the streets if um, if you were thought to be following Lollard views even, um, let alone following a movement or um, or a or an uprising. So it must have been really rather um, frightening times to live at this period, particularly if you probably might have agreed in your heart with some of what John Wycliffe was teaching. It sounds, um, yeah, an uncomfortable place to be. And of course, the secular powers and the ecclesiastical um, authorities were given the power to then burn people. And immediately after this statute was passed, um, one of those people, William Sotry, was burnt um, and he was the curate of St. Margaret's Lynn. So there we are. We have a priest themselves, the first person who's burnt as a Lollard. So a few years later, in 1407, Arundel presided at a synod in Ox Oxford, which passed a number of constitutions. And it's those constitutions from those trials which really give us an idea of what um, Lollards were accused of and what they were seen to be condemned for. And that gives us an idea of what was, what was the talk on the street at that time. And these constitutions enabled the church to regulate um, preaching, translation and use of scripture and also theological education. Now, all I can all I can say there is Arundel is pretty much um, pulling his weight, I would say, over the clergy um, of the time and absolutely pulling anyone who has any thought of um, following what Wycliffe may have taught back in their place. So it's really quite um, quite severe, but he's sorting out the clergy by imposing that, you know, only, only a priest can preach, not men or women, only a priest can, um, can translate for people the scriptures or even use the scriptures, and only a priest can um, educate, theologically educate so it's narrowed it all down. So somebody like Marjorie, once again, is walking a really, really fine line. Then in 1410, um, a body of Oxford censors uh, condemned 267 propositions, that's ideas, um, that were collected from Wycliffe's writings. So they've literally gone through his writings and said, nope, don't like that, nope, don't like that, nope, don't like that, nope, don't. And then gather them all together and said, this is what defines a Lollard. So it's actually got a lot, lot later than actually when Wycliffe was, was living. What's interesting, um, and it's at that point actually um, in 1410 that the clergy have been sort of suppressed 
and then Lollardy really becomes um, a movement of lay people. It's the laity who take it on quite, um, quite seriously. I was going to say it's really interesting that the death penalty um, seemed to have been quite seldom carried out until this 1410, when you have this real, you know, real sort of set of propositions. It's a bit like now we know how to define lollardy. Now we know what to try people by. And now we're able to actually condemn and put people to death. So in 14, 1414, John Oldcastle, absolutely, um, which was one of the Lollard Knights, um, he led a revolt which saw um, a minority of those hanged and burned. But it was still quite significant that actually we had a lay movement that rose up again. It must have triggered off in some people's minds the whole peasants' revolt of the um of the earlier um 1380s arundel absolutely squashed this by stamping authority even further um on the church bringing the clergy into line but also um getting the church authority to really assert itself and if you think about this episode that um that these these chapters that we've um, been reading this last week, you can see that someone like Marjorie, who's, you know, she's a bit, she can be a bit of a, you know, be a bit of a character. And also um, she, she goes around talking a lot. Um, but is she really a, a Lollard? Is she really going against the authority of the church? And yet quickly they're onto her and she's coming before the highest authorities of the land. So you can hear that this is a time of kind of anxiety, of really trying to crack down on anyone who might be perceived as being a Lollard or a heretic. An uneasy time to live, but how wonderful that in, we, in this book, we have that time of dis-ease and questioning absolutely captured by Marjorie's experiences. So that's my uh, little preamble into um, the wonderful Marjorie Kemp. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen as I usually do with some questions for you. Um, I'll share that. Let me go down to that one there. Okay. So there are some questions for you to ponder. I've tried to mix it up a little bit about, you know, what do you make of the text? Um, what do you make of what's happened to Marjorie? But also, um, how do you relate to what's going on? And have you ever had to, you know, stand up for your own, for your own faith like that? Because some people across the world are still still very much having to do that. 